Thanks for joining us today, uh, uh, Masora Sensei. Um, uh, we're kicking off this, um, this series of interviews to go along with the ASU newsletter. And uh, you're, you're our very first one. And again, thanks for, for joining us. Uh, before um, we get into the Aikido part of the interview, uh, I would like to ask you if you would tell us a bit about yourself before you discovered martial arts, understanding you dis you discovered martial arts quite early, I understand. But before that, what, what, what would you tell us about yourself? A uh, pretty ordinary life, I suppose. Moved to Florida from New Jersey when I was eight years old. Uh, and really what uh, I, I would say is the, a big influence in my life uh, before martial arts was my years in the Boy Scouts. Uh, I was a Cub Scout, Boy Scout at 11. I loved the idea of being out of doors, going camping. And uh, that was a very big part of my life up until I was about 16 or 17. Uh, I started martial arts uh, when I was 18, just after my birthday. And that was in 1968. So that sort of preparedness attitude, uh, a willingness to get out and train, to become more than I was, uh, that was that was probably the beginning of my attitudes towards those things. Fine, fine. I, I know one of the uh, the photographs that we're sharing um, on the, the the video component of this interview is actually a, a, a camping trip. Uh, that uh, you had with, uh, I believe, uh, uh, Saltomi Sensei and Akita Sensei, and was it Paul? Maybe Paul. Paul. Uh, Paul Blackstone. Uh, Paul Blackwood. Excuse me. Paul right. Blackwood. Right. Yeah. Right. So we'll we'll definitely. Patty make... was along too. Uh, she w just happened to be the photographer, uh, so she didn't end up in the photograph. Oh, the, but there were five of us on that canoe trip. The, so, you know, yeah, I would just say that uh, camping, fishing, canoeing, sailing have always been uh, a, a big part of my adult life. So, uh, so you found yourself in Florida. You're about 18 years old. And how did you become involved in martial arts? Uh, I assume Aikido wasn't, well, I'm sure Aikido wasn't your first experience. No, it wasn't. Uh, I think like most people at the time, I slowly became aware of the martial arts through reading, uh, through watching the occasional movie uh, where, you know, there was a few sequences. Uh, and so I, I became aware that they existed. And I would just say that uh, being one of the smaller guys, uh, gave me an incentive to uh, want to seek out something in the way of self-defense. Uh, but really, my first martial art experience was when I saw a notice in the Sarasota paper that a fencing club was ongoing at the Sarasota YMCA. And they mentioned when and where, and I went down there and took a look and wanted to join. And it just so happened that right after that class, some people were filing in wearing white uniforms and colored belts. And it just turned out that the karate club was following the fencing club that day. And so I stuck around and was invited to participate. So I did. And I liked it. It seemed to require a good deal of personal discipline. Uh, the sort of thing I like to do. And uh, that was my introduction to the martial arts. That would have fortuitous uh, event then. I mean, uh, you wouldn't have uh, discovered the, the karate and without the, the fencing. And of course, then right. this led you to um, Aikido. Uh, can you describe your first meeting or maybe your first training experience um, in Aikido, and how that led you maybe to, to meet up with uh, Satomi Shihan? Well, I had been in uh, 
karate for, I suppose, around uh, five years. Uh, it was after college, and there was a there was an Aikido demonstration in town that was going on, uh, and I had read about it, of course, uh, but this was an opportunity to go see some Aikido in action, and uh, it looked interesting. I, I sort of had the misconception at the time that Aikido was simply an, a grappling martial art as opposed to a pugilistic martial art like karate. And I thought that that sort of grappling would complement uh, the karate training that I already had. I would not say that about Aikido today. Aikido is not just a grappling martial art. Uh, but uh, that's what I was thinking at the time. Uh, what I saw wasn't terribly exciting, but it was really interesting. It was very different. The practice was very different from karate. And uh, I found it intriguing. Uh, was your first uh, uh, experience with Aikido, that wasn't with uh, Saltome Shihan, though, was it? Was it later that you met up uh, with him, or was he a part of that demonstration? Oh. No, he was not. This was with the uh, Florida School of Aikido, it was called, in Sarasota, Florida. Bill McIntyre was the instructor. Uh, and uh, you know, I didn't meet Salfome Sensei for another two years. So I was in Aikido for two years before I met Sensei. Excellent, excellent. So you, you knew a bit about it. And then uh, how did you come across Saltome Shihan? Well, that's a bit of a long story. That's when uh, Bill McIntyre in 1974 went over to Japan, trained for six weeks, met Saltome Sensei, and uh, invited him to send one of his students to America to be our teacher. And Sensei looked at Bill and said, I will come. And I know now, you know, many years later, that Sensei had been looking for a way to expand his Aikido horizons. At that time, he was already one of the full professors at Hambu and probably in line to become the chief instructor of Hambu uh, when Yamaguchi Sensei either retired or, or passed away. Uh, but Sensei, Saofongi Sensei wanted to expand his Aikido horizons. He wanted to travel. He wanted to teach people that were different from the Japanese. He wanted to export Aikido to the world. And so that's how that became, that's how that happened. It took another year after that before Saltome Sensei arrived in America. It took a lot of paperwork. It uh, took a lot of hard work uh, by all of us in Sarasota to make this happen. Uh, and it took a little bit of upfront money as well. But we were really committed to the project, and we wanted to help Bill out. And so eventually it happened. Uh, Salfome Sensei came, and I saw him in the dojo uh, the next day with his shirt off on the mat, and he was doing something that reminded me of karate. It, it was strange that way, because I didn't expect that. Uh, he was just doing some standard little movements, blocking, punching, whatever. Uh, and uh, it kind of told me that he was a different kind of Aikido instructor as well. Interesting. Um so let, let's, let's move, uh, let's kind of stick on that subject a little bit to your earliest days of training um, with Saltome Sensei. Um, understanding that, you know, as a human being and an individual, he's changed quite a bit since he started in Sarasota uh, teaching and developing ASU. But from those early days of training with him, were there elements in the dojo and the training that, uh, you'd like to share with us uh, things maybe we don't see or do as much of or uh, any sort of anecdote about those early days? Well, basically, I want to say that 
as far as we were able, and by this I mean the Sarasota Dojo people, we were, most all of us were below black belt level when he got there. He was really pushing us into a spontaneous, full speed style of training. Now, it didn't happen overnight. Uh, we were pretty clunky and slow and all that, but he was, he was pushing us. And he made his Aikido exciting. And as far as possible, it was full speed. We never did anything by the numbers. One, two, three, four. Uh, we did, with him, we did very little in slow motion, anything like that. Because I know now that he was training our instincts. And you don't train instincts really in slow motion. There are surprises that happen in Aikido technique and Aikido training. And they're a part of it. And you can't do that in slow motion when everybody knows what's going to happen. So he was really inspirational that way. He showed us that Aikido was a full speed martial art that was just kind of boundless in its uh, creative energy and what could be done with it. He would show us 15 different variations on a technique when he taught the class. Previously, we had just worked on imitating whatever the instructor was doing. He just demonstrated the principle of Irimidage or the principle of Kaitanage. And he would do it with 15 full speed variations and Uke did not know what was happening. That was another important part of our training to become good Ukes, uh, which we weren't up to that point. We could kind of fall, but that's very, a very small part of being a responsive Uke, especially in a demonstration. Uke is not supposed to know what's going to happen to him next. He comes in with an attack, usually one that's been requested, and then the instructor demonstrates many different variations on the technique so that the students begin to learn the principles behind the technique, not just a repetition of movements. I think that, to a large degree, when you slow things down, make it very repetitive, uh, is what kills the enthusiasm of people. And it also completely takes away the idea of instinctive training. It's just repetition, which is okay, especially for beginners. But more advanced people really need to push their limits on the map. That's how you make progress, not by staying in your comfort zone. Very well stated. Uh... Uh, comfort uh, is a place where uh, not much growth comes out of, uh, whether we're talking about martial arts or, or whatever we're talking about. So pushing, pushing exactly. those boundaries um, is yep. where our growth comes from. Yep. So obviously, you know, you've, you've got just, just decades of instruction and, and um, uh, experience with Aikido and, and ASU. I guess it's a it's a very general question, but um, I think there might be something interesting in your answer here. Um, what kept you coming back um, to you know to ha to create this sort of commitment that you you know you basically gave your life to this stuff? What what was it that you know hooked you? Well, I would have to say it's the people in Aikido. Uh, specifically at the time, it was the people in the Sarasota Dojo, of course. They were the ones I knew. But it was a friendly, outgoing, outgoing group of people. And I hate to say it, because uh, I don't want to do anything that sort of puts karate down, but it was a completely different atmosphere from most of the karate that I had seen uh, up to that point. Uh, the Aikido people were just open and fun-loving, and they did not feel like they were in competition with each other. And I think that's just a, an immense difference, and I, I see that in Aikido dojos 
all over. I, th- I think that's one quality that, at least from my observation, hasn't changed much since maybe those early days. I agree with you. So, speaking of change, um, when we when we talk to, to Aikido students and, you know, we're, we're talking to them about, you know, why, why do you come back? Why are you staying interested? Uh, everybody acknowledges different changes that it's had on them as an individual, whether it's physical or mental or... Uh, spiritual even, um, would would you want to share maybe your thoughts about how Aikido has changed you as a human being? Well, I would have to uh, add just a little bit more to my previous answer. Uh, when I had been in karate for some years, and maybe just my own personal nature, I felt more closed off from people. Yeah, you might say suspicious, but... It's a wariness that you develop that's, I would say, encouraged. And again, Aikido, I think, has helped me become a more open person. Uh, that's the biggest thing that I, at least I can see in myself. Perhaps somebody else would, see, would say something else, but that's what I, I can see in myself. Well, I'd, I'd like to explore that a little bit. Um, as far as becoming more open to, you know, other humans around you, particularly people who are, might not be in your closest circle, um, do, do you think that openness comes from sort of a, a pos- position of like, well, you know, I'm, I'm, I can honestly and, and pretty sure I can kick your ass? Or is it more of just being a part of a, a group um, where, You know, you see that openness going on. I I think it's both. Uh, The training in Aikido is very much to have your eyes open, to be aware of everything going around, going on around you, and not to put on some sort of a false face, uh, not trying to intimidate other people. when you practice in a martial art that focuses on competition, you are really focusing on that one person just in front of you. And if you're competing, and if you can intimidate that person, you've probably won your, your, uh, your match. You've probably won your uh, tournament or whatever. Uh, and since Aikido has none of that, and there is a a part of the training that says, look all around you, be aware of your surroundings. And the idea of just trying to intimidate and crush your opponent really is not a part of our training. We tend to disengage from people, uh, but the idea of taking someone down, hurting them, disabling them, is really not a part of our regular thought process. So I think through the training, we do get this more open attitude. It's not just a philosophical thing. You have to be more open. When you are doing Tenkan, you are looking around the room, around you, partly to see if anybody else is coming at you, but also you can take that as, who else out there do I have to protect? Or where is the door that I can run to to get out of this situation? Uh, and so just the physical training and I think just the, the way things are set up leads to a more open attitude towards the world. I'm curious, uh, as the pandemic begins to wane, hopefully soon, uh, people will start getting back out into society. Uh, at least we anticipate that. Uh, is there any advice you would share with ASU Dojo Cho uh, to help them spread the art and encourage more people to uh, to join and, and try it out? Well, the one thing that I would like to tell all of our instructors is at some point you've got to make Aikido training exciting again. Many people have gotten into small internal training, which is fine for seniors, but an awful lot of juniors and the people that you're trying to actually get to come in the door 
can't see or understand what you're doing. I would like more people to spend more time on fast-moving, martial-looking training, especially if you want the younger people to come in. They are generally not looking uh, at, you know, somebody my age and then thinking, wow, I want to be like him. You know, a 24-year-old that walks into the dojo is probably looking at a 30-year-old and thinking, wow, I want to be like him or her. Uh, that's a natural thing. Uh, also, just the Aikido demonstrations that just feature an older instructor and an older uke, where the uke can't take break falls anymore. Uh, again, if you want to appeal to younger people to get them into training, you've got to feature some of those younger people. Some of the older instructors are going to have to give up their positions uh, and their time and let some of the younger people come in because that, I think, is the key to getting young people to come into the dojo. If you want 60-year-olds to come in, feature 60-year-old uh, demonstrations. You know, I'm 70. There's a limit now to what I can do and teach. So that's my my basic uh, philosophy or advice to getting people going again. Uh, get out there, make it big so that the people in the back of the room can see what you're doing. Make it exciting. Uh, and, you know, hopefully we're going to see a few more younger people come into the dojo. I like the way you put it. Uh, let the people in the back of the room see what's going on. Um, that that's that's mm -hmm. really uh, something we we we've, we've got to focus on. I think as an organization, because those young people are, are who we've got to get in to uh, uh, not only pay the bills but to uh, to to continually challenge us. I would say as yeah, well. And to carry on the art someday. Ab absolutely. So um, one other one other thing since we're we're talking about pandemia a little bit, um, and of course this this won't be forever. But um, I wonder, uh, do you are, are there? You know, we're all thinking about how to train, how to keep our center, how to keep our flexibility and our mindset with Aikido going. Since a lot of us aren't training uh, person to person, um, do you have anything you might share with us about how you're continuing to train uh, during this time? Well, I, I have to admit that I have not taught a class since February. It was a seminar in Oregon, and uh, things have been shut down then. Uh, partly what's happened here in Panama City, Florida, where I, I live now, is we had a Category 5 hurricane, Hurricane Michael, go over our heads. It ruins most of the buildings in town. And I've spent really the last two years fixing up things. Uh, it's only about a month ago I've had any free time at all uh, for anything else in the last two years. So, you know, I would encourage people who want to continue with uh, some sort of physical training, uh, running, you know, whatever they can do, swimming, push-ups, uh, that will be good for you. Uh, really, at age 70 now, I don't do that stuff anymore. I've run many miles. I've swum for hours. I don't feel drawn to it now. Uh, and, you know, people are going to have to start dojos all over again. And a natural place to look for, to start a dojo is in a YMCA or a rec center. You tend to find active people already there. Uh, people who are looking for something to do end up at those places. If you've lost your dojo, think about starting one over again and getting try to draw in some of those people from that already existing community. Um, myself, I stay involved in a number of levels. Uh, I'm on the ASU board of directors. We have monthly meetings. We have projects that we're carrying on. Uh, it's not physical training in any sort. 
any sense, but it is part of the ongoing interreaction and in, interaction that goes on with Aikido people, with other Aikido people, with the community out there. And to a large extent, that is a large part of self homey senseis and O senseis message. They were not just saying, uh, become a really big, tough guy. They were saying, learn to interact with people. And that can mean learn to interact with your family, your neighbors, your community, your nation, the world as a whole. I mean, this is all part of the grander Aikido message. It's not just about creating a lone tough guy hero. It's about somebody who can work and build with the rest of your community. So it sounds like you've been applying your Aikido teachings uh, to the aftermath of the hurricane since we've uh, uh, gone into a pandemic state. Yeah, I, you know, the pandemic has really, really uh, been tough for lots of people. Uh, I miss people, and I miss being in a dojo. I mean, we, we don't have a dojo here anymore. Uh, the building is gone. Uh, so some of these things we're going to have to leave up to the next generation. I have to admit that the idea of teaching beginners how to do forward rolls is no longer possible for me. Mm. I don't want to do any forward rolls. So, you know, there are other people out there who are going to carry that on. Uh, and, you know, to a large extent, we as instructors, if we've done our job properly, we're going to leave people behind us who are going to carry on all this work. Again, it's not just about creating one tough guy. It's about creating a community of people who are going to continue this work on long after we're gone. Well, thank you very much for the time uh, today, Sensei. Uh